All righty. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, I am beyond excited to be here in Vancouver. I've been to Vancouver a couple of times. I've never been to UBC. Um, Shriram, who Gregor was talking about, the moment I told him that I was invited to give this talk, he said, UBC is a big deal. Don't screw it up. Um, <laughs> although he did not use the word screw. Um, so I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, so I'm, I'm the co-director of this program called Bootstrap. Uh, I work closely with Shriram and Kathy over at Brown University. I'm also sort of a, a distant cousin of the, the Racket team and the How to Design Programs team. So it's a real pleasure to be here with Gregor. I know some of you have been through some of his classes. You've seen the HTDP way. Some of you might like it. Some of you might have nightmares about it. But we're going to talk about it together. Um, the focus of this talk is about computer science education. And I specifically am talking about uh, K to 12. So undergrad and grad school, university level is quite different. Um, but I want to talk about what goes on in K-12. And I, I find it useful to start this kind of talk with a simple question. So we're at UBC. A lot of, who in the audience is a, a, a computer science person? I know we have some ed folks, some HCI. OK, a lot of folks. So you guys, you're here at UBC. There's a super strong programming language bench. Some of you are you know, hardcore folks in Java. I mean, of course, Aspect J. Um, you're all about you know, your Haskells and your schemes and your, your Pythons, your R's. So this is a real question that is asked of people like you all the time. They walk into your office or your room and they say, hey, I want to teach computer science. You're the expert. What should I use? So popcorn style, let's go. What should they use? Python. 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 What? Python. Python. No. Icon. Icon. OK. What else? Ah, racket. Oh, racket. Yeah, yes. You know, 10 points. 10 points for him. OK. Great. Fantastic. The, and by the way, this is how that conversation goes all over the world and all over the internet. Here's a screenshot. Somebody asks, hey, I want to you know, teach some coding classes to my kids. I started a club. What should I use? And here someone answers, not even any pros, just a link to Scratch. right? This person says, no, 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 I think Logo is really cool. Someone else says, oh, no, maybe you should do Python, whatever, right? This con notice that your answer was about, you know, you picked the language. All right, forget what I said. Now someone walks into your office and says, oh, you guys are all computer scientists. Um, I have a really cool idea for a software program, and I want to build it, but I don't know any programming. Oh, I shouldn't have given that away. They're saying, uh, I've got some programming experience. I want to build a program. What should I use? Say it again? Depends on what you're building. What? Why? <laughs> what? <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. What other questions might you ask this person? So what are you building? What else? What do you know? What do you know? Are you Who's going to use it? What do you want to know? Yeah? Working with you. Ah, who else is working with you? Do you, yeah, do you need to make it? Oh, here, here's a fun one for 2019. Uh, is it running on iOS or not? Because that's going to kind of constrain my answer. Is it going to be based off of other systems? Fabulous. Fabulous. Yeah. Ah, ooh, great question. Yeah. Ah, ha, ha, even better. Now, I want to point something out, which is that when I gave you a question that you identify as a software engineering question, you put on your engineer's hats and started asking about constraints. What are you building? What does it run on? Right? I can't just tell you what tool to use because I don't know the constraints. But when I asked you a question that didn't sound like an engineering problem, it was no problem just spitting out Python as the definitive answer. <laughs> and this is worrisome. So let's put our software engineer hats on again and think back to that teacher or that person who came into our room. What are some constraints that we might need to care about if we wanted to work in K-12? How old are the kids? Ah, how old are the kids? Yes, what else? What are they hacking for all the keyboards? Yes, good. Do they have Do they have computers? How much time do they have? Yeah, is it an hour every single day or just three hours once a month? Yeah, how motivated are the kids? And parallel to that is, are they self-selecting? Are they being force marched into it? Yep. Yeah, who's going to answer their questions? Are you, the teacher, going to be answering the questions? Maybe there are constraints of the person asking you. 
Well, yeah, good. What else? You're getting some good constraints here now that you've got your engineer's hats on. Last call, going once. All right, so, so here's my first slide of normal constraints, and I think you guys nailed almost every one. How old are they? That was the first question, yep. What exposure have they had before? Are these kids like PowerPoint professionals or masters of monads? That's gonna matter a lot. <laughs> um, is, it a is it a required class, right? Or are they self-selecting? That really changes things. How long is the class? What time, right? How often does it meet? Is it even a class, right? Maybe it's an after-school club or like a drop-in, like graham crackers and O-camel kind of thing. Like, <laughs> don't laugh, that's a real thing someone did. Um, how many students are there, right? Is this a small club or is this like, are you a public school teacher who's trying to wrangle 35 kids? There are some more constraints that, that you need to know something about education to ask, although I suspect once you see them, you'll, you'll nod and say, oh yeah, that's a constraint. Um, is there internet access? Has the teacher programmed before? Can the students type? Right, you might be like, well, why would we even bother with that? Because lots of kids can't. Are there students with disabilities? Are the students blind? Are they deaf? Do they have cognitive impairments? Because that's gonna affect your answer too. Do students have regular computer access at home? Are, they, are we expecting they're gonna be doing programming assignments at home? Do they have regular computer access at school? Right, maybe it's a laptop cart that comes around for 30 minutes every Friday. Or maybe there is no laptop cart and the teacher is desperate to do something involving coding. So, the, the, the takeaway here is, you guys are all good engineers, and the moment you realize that we could think about this as a constraints problem, you immediately started picking through all the constraints, and there's a whole lot more that we, not being K-12 teachers, might not be aware of. But our gut reaction when I put up that first question was, oh, do Python, or Racket. And that's a serious problem in K-12 education, because they come to us, the experts, for advice, and we don't even ask them what their needs are. It's not about the tool and it's not about the language. And we end up in this endless cycle as a community of coming up with the newest, coolest tool. Scratch is lame. Scratch is tired. Snap is wired. Snap is tired. Tinker is wired. No, it's Alice. No, here's some new paradigm for programming. We spend tons of money and lots of smart brains building new tools without ever asking about the constraints. Schools don't love that, by the way. So let's think back to software, right? A complicated software project has characteristics that you all should recognize. Systems are complex, they're fragile, there's lots of dependencies that we're aware of, there's lots of hidden dependencies. You, you upgrade a package that seems fine and suddenly other stuff in your program breaks. Progress takes time. It requires a lot of training. It, it takes a skilled software engineer who spent years practicing their craft to sit down in front of a new code base, and once they do, guess what? It takes more time to learn that code base. It requires resources. Bugs have consequences. Architectural early bugs will bedevil you for years, if not decades, depending on how long your software is around for. Guess what? Education is no different. And if you think that there's a single one of these constraints that doesn't also exist in a classroom, you should not answer the teacher who asks you for help. You should just say, I don't know enough. Because in schools, all of these constraints exist. And there are far more dependencies and hidden dependencies that I bet would shock you um, that we need to be aware of before we go telling schools what to teach. So, um, I co-direct along with Shuram and Kathy a, a modest program called Bootstrap. This map is woefully out of date. There should be a lot more bubbles. Um, we reach about 25,000 students every single year. And while we're very pleased with our scale, this makes us one of the largest in-school deployments of computer science in the United States, we're much more proud of our diversity. So, m more than 43% of our students are girls and young women. Nearly 50% self-identify as being African-American or Latino, which in the US, these are under, deeply underrepresented groups in computing. I haven't had enough coffee. And the reason that we get these numbers, because by the way, at least in the US, nobody gets 43% girls and young women. People brag about 16%. Um, the reason we get this is because we work with mainstream teachers who reach every child in the school already. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, and I should also add that we do have a number of teachers around the world. This is just a few you know, flags that I was able to find quickly, um, but there's a whole lot more who are using our stuff in different contexts. 
So, like any engineering effort, having defined the constraints, we should also set about defining our metrics. How do we know what success looks like if we haven't defined it beforehand? Otherwise, we'll just roll out a program and declare victory because we never really de de defined it to begin with. So I would posit that there are three ingredients that define a successful national K-12 computer science effort. Look, without equity, we could easily get computer science in every single city in Canada, right? That would be easy if we stopped caring about equity. We'll find a bunch of like rich white boys and like have them do some coding stuff, and then we'll be fine. But obviously that's not satisfactory. So equity, I think, is a key metric for success. Similarly, you can find a charismatic, brilliant computer science teacher, I'm sure there's at least one in Vancouver, who reaches every child in the school teaching wonderful content. But until cloning is invented, we can't scale that teacher. And scale is also really critical. If we're doing something wonderful for just the local kids who are near the university, but it can't be replicated everywhere else, we still haven't met our benchmarks. And then look, hour of code. Is that a big deal in Canada? I know it's big in the US. Are you familiar with this? This is the code.org, like kids sit down and play for an hour and then they get a little certificate. Hour of code is like a big deal in the US. Um, and, but even Hadi Partovi of code.org would be the first to stand up and say, that is not rigorous CS education, that is merely exposure. And so I think rigor is also a critical component because if we just teach watered down CS to everyone and check the box, we haven't really accomplished anything. Getting any one of these takes some elbow grease. Getting two is exceptionally hard. If we want to pull this off, we need all three. Those are our metrics. So, next step, engineering. Let's define the solution space, right? What are some possible avenues? Number one, required courses. Every child in Canada or the US or insert country here must take a CS class to graduate. Number two, same thing, but it's not required. Kids can opt in. Number three, forget classes. After school programs, out of school programs, summer boot camps, family code nights, informal things. And then finally, integrated courses, right? Try to get computing to be taught through the existing mainstream courses. So let's go through them one at a time. Making computer science a required course for everyone. Seems like a great idea. Well, required courses don't scale. And here's the problem. So in the United States, you need about 20,000 teachers just to reach every ninth grader. So first thing you have to do is create a computer science teacher certification, because you can't just teach any class you want willy-nilly. That takes a lot of years and a lot of dollars. And in the US, there isn't even a national certification, so it's state by state. Hopefully in Canada, you guys are in a better situation where if you're a bio teacher in, you know, in Quebec, you can like move, out, you know, move out to British Columbia and still teach bio. Is that true? It is? Thank goodness. OK, so, so you'll need a computer science teacher certification. Maybe Canada is already there. That would be amazing. But even if it is, guess what? Now we have to actually recruit and train those teachers. That's going to take more years and more dollars. And if we're actually training them well to the point where they know what they're doing, well, they could make a whole lot more doing something else. But let's wave the magic fairy dust wand and say that they don't. Now we still have to pay them, which means adding potentially billions of dollars a year to any country's education budget in perpetuity. But you know what? Mark Zuckerberg's a nice guy. He's just going to give all that money away. All the problems are solved, right? No. There's the laws of time and space, you see? There's only so many rooms in the school and only so many hours in the day. So what are we going to cut to make room for computing? Right? These are big problems that take years to solve, and we've got to solve every one of them just to implement such a course. So right off the bat, bye-bye scale. Maybe you can do it in the big cities. You can get everyone in Vancouver to do it because there's a lot of engineers around, there's the university. Maybe you can pull this off. But I highly doubt that if you go like way up north or into rural schools, you're going to be able to make this happen. So by scale. But there's something else that happens when you make computer science a requirement. There's a perverse incentive. Because schools don't like it if half their kids don't graduate. That's kind of bad for a school. And on a personal level, speaking as a teacher, I do not want to be the teacher who fails a kid who was about to be the first in her family to go to university because she couldn't pass my Python class. So these are structural and personal incentives to get rid of what? Rigor. Bye-bye. You know what? Let's just make it a scratch class. Everybody will be happy. No one gets their lives ruined. And that often winds up happening. So the incentive structure puts rigor at risk. But hey, everybody will take it, so you'll get equity. Mark Guzdial, if you don't know him, he is one of the luminaries in the CS education field. He has an extremely widely read blog. He's an amazing researcher. 
He has published a number of papers outlining the risk of required CS. There are some serious dangers in place if you put this mandate on schools without considering the needs that are, have to be met in order to carry it out. So, strategy number two. Everything I just said, but it's not required. Just let the kids opt in who want to opt in. That should fix the problem, right? Well, the problem with electives is that they're not equitable. You see, first of all, the only kids who take elective computer science are the ones who chose it over and above elective everything else. So there's a selection bias issue. Maybe it's the kids who already identify as computer geeks who take this class. Everyone else takes other classes. This reinforces stereotypes about what kind of kid belongs in a coding class. Right? Kids grow up seeing, oh, look, all the hackers in movies and television, they all look like white boys. And now I went to school, and it's true. So this is not a good thing. But it gets far worse, because you see, lots of schools have graduation requirements. You have to take a certain number of units of math, a certain units of science, of history, or English, and things like that, right? And so there's a course schedule. Um, so here is a sample contrived course schedule at an elite, privileged high school. You will notice that every student gets four years of various art classes. This is not the case at most schools. So this is like the most generous, optimal situation. Look what happens when one kid fails, let's say, Algebra 1. So I've outlined the damage in orange. Right off the bat, calculus disappears, which means that that kid is no longer going to get the four units of math required to graduate. So what do they do? Well, we're going to, first of all, have them retake Algebra 1. We will enroll them in a remedial math class to make damn sure they pass it. And then we're going to throw in applied math to get that fourth pseudo credit so it still counts. On top of that, most sciences have a dependency on algebra. If you don't know functions, you ain't modeling projectile motion in physics, you're not balancing chemical equations, and so on and so forth. So their science pipeline is screwed up too. So suddenly failing one required course means that their ability to take electives has almost collapsed. What if they fail two? Right, so now that we've added financial math to get, that, to get them that credit, they're now being enrolled in a test prep class to make sure they pass whatever exam the high school has or perhaps the state has. Um, the bottom line is, the moment you fail a required class, your ability to take electives collapses. And do you think that the distribution of kids who fail required classes is completely normal across all students? The end result here is that we're just exacerbating existing achievement gaps. The kids who are the most at risk, the kids who fail the most, well, they ain't going to take any electives. So if you put computing into an elective class, they ain't getting no computer science. So back to our, uh, our metrics here. Well, equity has gone out the window. But there's something else that happens. Suppose you're the principal of a small school, and you want to offer a CS elective. Are you really going to hire a full-time CS teacher to just teach, like, an elective class part-time? That's a waste of money. What are you going to do instead? I heard someone say it. Use your existing teacher. Yeah, use your existing teacher. You know, <laughs> go over to the art teacher and say, hey, art teacher, you do Photoshop, right? That's basically computer science. <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you teach the computing class? And so guess what else we lose? You can say it loudly. We lose rigor. Right? These classes are often watered down because they don't have a content expert to teach it. Yeah? Not always. I That is a fantastic happenstance. <laughs> you got lucky, which is fantastic. But not everyone gets so lucky. All right. So a lot of people have looked at these, the first two things and said, you know what? Schools are just unfixable balls of dysfunction. <laughs> Let's route around the damage and do out of school computer science. After school clubs, weekend clubs, summer boot camps, right? That'll work great. And um, I'll tell you just right now, no. <laughs> um, not to say that those aren't valuable mechanisms for exposure and enrichment. They totally are. 
But we're not talking about exposure and enrichment. We want to get equity, rigor, and scale. Back in 2007, Bootstrap had built one of the largest after-school computer science infrastructures in the United States. We found a nationwide after-school program that served thousands of kids, that gave the kids snack, they helped them with their homework, and then once a week they deposited them into the school's computer lab, and it was our job to import you know, engineers and undergrads and grad students and professors to come teach some computing after school. And that's what we were doing at enormous scale. And when we looked at the impact we were having, we were so embarrassed, we shut the whole thing down. We just shut it down. Why? Well, the first problem is that after-school computer science competes with after-school sports, and after-school theater, and after-school having a job, and after-school taking care of your little sister because your mom has to work. Bye, equity. The other problem is that students are exhausted after a long day of school like genuinely exhausted. And they may not be that interested in like going through the nuances of object-oriented programming and recursion after a long day. Also, after-school programs do not have rigorous expectations for attendance. And so kids may just not show up for a week or two. And so it's very difficult to build a serious computing class on top of this. So rigor often disappears as well. Now again, you might get lucky. There might be an amazing professor or, or student at UBC who offers an after-school coding club for kids who really want to be there. And they set high expectations for parents. Maybe the parents have to put down a $100, you know, $100 deposit that they only get back if the kid shows up. You can do that. But that's not going to scale. So all of these options are kind of bad. Maybe there's a least bad option. So in our opinion, we think there is, it's worth exploring that fourth option. And I want to pause with an in equation. Everyone should learn computing. How many of us agree with that statement? It's good for everyone to learn computing. Just a few hands. Wow, some of you are real skeptics. That's funny, given how many of you said you're computer science. Um, lots of people agree that, that everyone should learn computing, but that does not imply that everyone should take computer science courses. So let's open our thinking a bit and look at strategy four, integrated courses. What if we could convince every history teacher to teach computing in the history class? Now, I know that sounds insane. Pause for a moment on why it's insane. Suppose we could do it. Man, that would be awesome. Look, every child takes history. So you get scale right off the bat. In fact, you're leveraging the existing infrastructure. There are already history teachers at every school. The courses are already added to the course calendar. They're already added to the course schedule, so you don't need to you know, fight with who's teaching what. It's already there. So you can get to massive scale at a fraction of the time and a fraction of the cost. So that's a good thing. And once again, every child takes history, which means you're reaching every child, not just those who self-select into the electives or after-school programs. So everyone who takes history realizes coding is just a thing that we do. Right? What do you mean girls can't code? I'm a girl. Lots of girls were in my history class. We all coded along with the boys. I don't understand what's the problem. Right? So you can, you can actively combat some negative stereotypes this way. So you get equity as well. Also, if you're leveraging existing infrastructures, these have professional organizations. They have standards for content, standards for training, standards for assessment. And maybe if we design it really carefully, we can leverage those standards to ensure some degree of rigor. So, you know, free lunch, right? Of course, really, um, we've traded one set of constraints for another. Because if you want to do integration, you're going to have to convince that history teacher or that science teacher to give up X number of hours from what they were doing to go teach something that ain't their job, ain't their expertise, and God help you if, you, if their kids do worse on the final exam that year because they spent all that time teaching computing, they're going to come after you with brass knuckles. Um, if you want to sell teachers on integration, essentially you're arguing transfer. How many of you have heard of, of computational thinking? Right? Kids learn all kinds of things. If they learn computing, they'll learn biology. And Papert said it loudest. In 1960, one of the first papers on Logo, Papert said, Logo's amazing, it's got functions and variables, ergo, kids who learn Logo will transfer their understanding of functions and variables into algebra. He called it out specifically, and they will do better at algebra. And everyone sort of believed it and clicked their heels three times and said there's no place like algebra, and boom, it works. Mm. 
Popper was making an assumption of transfer, and everyone who tells you that computing helps teach you how to think, and that's good for everything, is making an assumption of transfer. Transfer is defined in the cognitive science literature as a skill learned in one context is used successfully in another. Transfer is hard. Talk to someone in the ed school. Talk to someone in cognitive science. Transfer is so much harder than people realize. I can distill some of the literature into three requirements. First of all, it requires explicit instruction. You have to literally say, look how we solved this problem on the computer. Notice how similar it is to the mechanism we use to solve this problem in biology. That is not an accident. There is a connection between the two. You have to literally say it. Just assuming kids will be like, oh, I learned, I learned about algorithms on the computer, therefore I know about them in biology. No, that's not going to happen. Secondly, deep structural similarities between tasks. Super deep. Deeper than you can possibly imagine. I will tell you a sad tale. Um, uh, Dave Perkins, a researcher in cognitive science, looked at a physics classroom. And there was a physics teacher who spent a week giving his kids practice problems on acceleration. And all the problems were of the form, a golf ball is dropped from a tower. A golf ball is dropped from a tall cliff. A golf ball is dropped from some great height. Let's do all these different things to compute where it is after x time, how fast it's moving after y time, and so on. Then he gives his kids a quiz. The kids bomb a bunch of the problems on the quiz. In fact, they bomb all these problems that are like, a golf ball is dropped down a missile silo. A golf ball is dropped down you know, a, a, a deep hole. And the kids are furious for not preparing them. What was their argument? Why were they saying he didn't prepare them? We did tower problems, not hole problems. Failure of transfer. And this, by the way, was not at a struggling school, not by a long shot. Novice learners should not be expected to distinguish between superficial parts of a problem, oh, it's a tower versus a hole, versus structural isomorphisms between problems. Oh, it's an acceleration problem with gravity. Right? They don't necessarily know. And so that was a failure of transfer. They did not transfer what they learned about tower problems to hole problems. Now, if zoom out. Teaching kids Python is totally going to help them in math. Would you take that bet? I sure wouldn't. There need to be freakishly deep structural similarities between tasks. And on top of that, there needs to be an established process for performing the tasks. Don't just give kids a bunch of programming problems, hope that they learn something and they'll apply it elsewhere. You actually need to do some metacognition and say, what mechanism did we employ to solve this problem? Let's describe it in the abstract. Let's then describe it in this other domain. And we're teaching the task. Yeah. This stuff at all? I mean, if, it, if students can't transfer you know, tower problems to whole problems, is there any point teaching them tower problems? Well, no, so, so it's not that, they're, that I don't think kids can. It's just that transfer is harder than we thought. And so anyone who's making a transfer claim needs to be prepared to back it up with a lot of elbow grease and data. So I do think there's merit. But we can't be so cavalier as to say, why wouldn't you learn computing? It's going to help you with math. And everyone needs to know math. Like, just, just that statement scares me. I don't think that it's an untrue statement, or I'm sorry, I don't think it's an always false statement. But we need to be so much more humble when we make claims like that, especially if we're talking to teachers and if we're talking to teachers in schools that are not elite. Um, so another, a, a more pithy way of phrasing this problem about the process is this, and you can quote me. We need to stop lying to ourselves and claim that we are teaching problem solving simply because we give kids problems to solve. Right? Problem solving is a methodology, and, it, is do and it, there, it turns out that there are domain-specific methodologies. And so just giving kids problem after problem after problem and hoping that they've figured out the connection, some kids will, most won't. Or even worse, they'll, think, they'll find a connection, but it's the wrong connection. So let's talk about similarities between tasks. So how does an engineered CS education like Bootstrap tackle mathematics? So we looked at algebra. So how similar are math and programming? I mean, if there's any two that people talk about being similar, it's these guys, right? So in math, you know, we have numbers. Does programming have numbers? Oh, good, you're, you're not sure. Good. <laughs> well, let's take Java, right? Everyone knows that in Java, 1 divided by 2 is? <laughs> 
I just type it in, one divided by two. It's obviously zero, right? Anybody know why? You know, you already took too much time to explain it. I'm a math teacher, I don't have time to explain that. It's not in my scope and sequence. I mean, what you said is right. But if, you want a, if you're expecting a math teacher to take up their time explaining why that is, th that is not their job, nor is it their competency. And even if they do explain it, do you think kids are gonna grok that right away? No, they're just gonna be, oh, this program doesn't work. You got variables that ain't variables. This is like programming 101 in high schools or middle schools. Scratch even has a button called make a variable that lets you write this program. Why would an algebra teacher be deeply upset calling x a variable here? It mutates. So we have two problems. First, mutation is not part of mathematics. It is hard even for computer scientists. I've certainly been bitten by this bug, where I've mutated state. It's not even in math. The second problem is, that's a semantic problem. The second problem is a syntax problem. That sure looks like we've proven that zero equals one. So I wish to God that we were, we'd stop calling these things variables, because man, the math folks had it first. Um, and of course you've got functions that aren't functions. Right? How many functions do we know of in computer science that return nothing? Or that mutate state and return different outputs for the same input? They violate the vertical line test. If tower versus whole problems was a challenge, there's no way in heck that this is gonna help kids in math. And it might actually do some damage. Now, I know that you know, a lot of the folks in this room in particular are sitting here smiling going, yeah, functional programming, that's the key, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and I'm, here, I'm here to tell you, yeah, it's part of what we need for this particular context, but it's not everything. Because in addition to teaching functional programming, you also need to make sure that you're actually doing math problems with that programming language. Right? You can write a, a whole compiler, right? And then maybe at some part in the compiler, you needed to compute the Levenstein distance to make sure that like a mistyped variable, it gave you like a good recommendation. Did you mean to type that variable? And like typing the Levenstein distance required you to use some algebraic formula. Did you teach math? No. Doing math on the computer is not the same as teaching math. So yes, use the right language that, is, that supports the semantics of the target discipline, but then do stuff with it that any teacher in that discipline identifies as authentic. They can say, yeah, I do that in my class already. Cool, I just have to type it in instead of writing on the board, I'm with you. The third thing you need to do is have a process, a pedagogy for how you solve your problems that maps to the pedagogy and best practices of that discipline. So I'll give you the example that we use for math. So in Bootstrap Algebra, that's the name of our math curriculum, guess what, we use pencil and paper workbooks. We have discovered something that every teacher knows. Sometimes the best place to get real thinking done is not in front of the screen. And so here's a word problem. Write a function called update target, which takes in the target's x coordinate and produces the next x, which is 50 pixels to the right. Now, I could find and replace certain words. This is a very trivial linear function word problem. Now, we ask students to write the contract. For those of you, you guys call it contracts. HTTP peers, yes? Okay, so we, we have students write the contract, they have to write the name of the function, the type of its input, the type of its outputs. Then they have to write a purpose statement, right? They're commenting their code. Then they have to write examples of specific concrete inputs. So here we go. Then we have to identify what changes between these examples, and then we generalize to the formal function definition. Standard HTTP stuff. This is the explicit process that we teach. If I said exactly the same thing but I swapped out the words, a math teacher would hear the following. When you give kids a word problem, oh, sorry, uh, computer science, type specification, test cases, code, right? Math teacher would hear, having students think through the domain and range of a function, having students restate the problem in their own words, writing input-output tables for specific inputs and how they're computed, asking themselves what's the rule, what's the pattern, and then specifying the function in a symbolic form. This is considered best practices in mathematics. So simply changing the words might be enough for a math teacher to say, oh, that's something I already do. Cool, this isn't so foreign to me. And it's not just smoke and mirrors where we're trying to convince them. 
Remember, we want the students to also recognize that it is the same task applied to both contexts. So, multiple representations of code, multiple representations of function, kids totally get this. And so in bootstrap algebra, as in any respectably rigorous uh, programming construct, we have students build systems. So in this case, we have students build a very simple video game, but it's not like, do whatever game you want. No, no, it's a very carefully structured game. In fact, all kids wind up making games that look very similar, although the kids don't seem to think so. And the process of creating this game requires them to go deep into coordinate planes, order of operation, ratio and proportion, and then hardcore into word problems. Almost the entire curriculum is word problems on word problems on word problems. For linear functions, quadratic functions, piecewise functions. And every time they do a programming exercise, they are solving a word problem. And then the teacher can pull out a word problem from the math book and show students how to solve it using the exact same steps that are named the same thing. And the programming language reinforces instead of undermines the math in the book. And at the end, kids get up and talk about what they did. We do code reviews. Math teachers call it explaining your work. And by the way, we actually have some success. So this is the most important thing. We give kids pre and post tests. Guess how much programming is on them? None. Because who cares? We take word problems borrowed from standard algebra tests. And what we've shown is that there is a statistically significant gain pre to post. So a math teacher who doesn't give a crumb about computer science can view this as a math intervention. And so can a school, and so can a school district. So, summarizing what we've got so far, we have sort of a dependency graph if you want to do integrated computing. You gotta pick the right tool, you gotta design a curriculum, and you gotta think through your pedagogy. Your pedagogy cannot be, teach kids how to use Python and then just let them go nuts. That is not a pedagogy. That's not a thing kids, can, teacher, kids and teachers can strip onto, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, first of all, thank you for the papers. I'm Mark Green Street. Oh, yeah. Right, advisor, yeah. and Gail's right here. Yeah. So we went over your, we went over your papers in other seminars. Yeah. And one of the questions that the students were asking, mm -hmm. actually, we're here in this room right now, mm -hmm. was, okay, so you, you do this pre-test. Yep. You go through your boot camp program. Yep. And you do the post-test. Yep. Now, what would happen if, instead of bothering with any of this stuff, what if I just tried to teach some traditional math curriculum and just reinforce their exercises? Yep. So we also, we also have a control group. What's that? We also had a control group. Okay. And so what we found in the 2013 paper is that the students who had math with bootstrap outperformed the control group by a significant margin. Yeah. Um, so, tool, curriculum, pedagogy. If there's only one thing you take away from this talk, it's that you need all three, and you need all three to be carefully tweaked to support the host discipline. So, if you want math, what is, and by the way, there's a, dependent, there's a dependency relationship between each of these. The tool you choose shapes your pedagogy. If your pedagogy involves kids writing worked examples and programming them into the computer, guess what? Java is a bad tool, because eighth graders are not gonna use JUnit to write their tests. And if you use Scratch, there is no testing functionality. So that affects your pedagogy. And I'm not saying Java's bad or Scratch is bad. Just choose these things conscientiously. So for math, at the tool level, functional programming, I think, is key. Right? It's, it's necessary but not sufficient. It, easy unit tests make it possible for teachers to do worked examples. Make important data first class. Everyone has first class numbers. Lots of teachers do ratio and proportion and geometry and coordinate planes. First class images are such a game changer for this. If kids have to write images to a buffer, render that buffer and then check it out, like that's five steps that they don't need to be taking. At the curricular level, a curriculum is not a list of activities. I know this is like weird for the CS folks, but for the ed folks, you know this. A curriculum involves lesson plans, standards alignment, homework assignments, assessments, rubrics. It involves, in some cases, do nows. What should the student do the moment they walk in that room that day? Or exit slips. What do they need to do before the class is over, right? And, and these constraints differ depending on where you're teaching. So you need to be ready for that. If you hand a list of fun activities and a nifty tool, you haven't given them anything usable. And once again, the curriculum needs to be aligned to the host discipline. So if it's math, it better look like a math curriculum. And then pedagogy. Once again, for math, you need a, a problem-solving method that works for word problems. It should embrace multi-representations uh, multi and worked examples. And this will look different for a history class. 
It should. Otherwise, that's a suggestion you may not have done your homework. So, rinse and repeat. We also have created a curriculum called Bootstrap Data Science. We're really excited about this. This has been part of my life for the last few years. So, really quickly, just to see how this formula plays out in a different context. One way to think about data science is sort of a three-ring circus that involves computer science, some element of statistics, and then some domain knowledge, right? I can be a statistician who knows R, but if I don't know anything about baseball, it's not useful to, to have me analyzing baseball data sets, right? There's some ridiculous outlier. I don't know if that outlier is noise that should be eliminated or if it's a really important outlier. I have to know the domain. So what might this look like in K-12? Well, the computer science does not have to be heavyweight. You can do a lot of simple data science using lightweight programming. You can teach school-relevant math. There's a lot of statistics in the standards for schools. Find out what that is, make sure your data science curriculum teaches it, and then assess it and make sure it does. And what about the domain knowledge? What subject in high school or middle school does data science belong in? I, I, list them out. What do you got? What do you got? History, biology, chemistry. Yeah, there's tons of broad applications. You open a history textbook, and guess what you see every 10th page? Charts, graphs, and tables. Right? You still, you want, in, in, in the United States, American history, we talk about immigration waves in the early 1900s, and there's tons of charts there. And a common pedagogy for history teachers is, what do the charts tell you? Can you interpret them? Can you make an inference and turn the inference into a prediction? And now let's talk about modern history. Immigration is kind of a hot topic over in the States. Let's, just, let's write a paper explaining why we think it's good or bad, referencing the data we saw in the book. Well, example two. How might an engineered computer science education program tackle history? Well, history books have all these things. Students write papers referring back to historical trends, charts, graphs, tables. Well, look at our dependency graph. Tool, curriculum, pedagogy, lots of interdependencies. Well, in this case, the tool better have compatible semantics. I don't particularly care about mutation when I'm doing data science, so let's just keep it functional just because we won't piss off the math teacher down the hall. Um, instead of first class images, I need first class tables. Right? I should be able to pass tables back and forth. If tables are values, then queries are functions. And so we can do a lot with that. And the predictions that students make, those are essentially unit tests of the inferences they drew from the data. I write a curriculum. Use the same data from the book. Align to the history standards. Have students actually write a research paper. Only in this case, now I can say, look, it's no worse than looking at the table in the book. Right? If worst, case, worst comes to worst, just click run, there's the table. Turn to page 67, there's the table. We haven't done any harm. But now we can say this table is live. You might have a student who's got a lot of family from Ireland. I'm showing my, my background in teaching in Boston. Well, that student might say, I want to see a table just for Irish kids, just for Irish immigrants. That's what I care about. Great, you can do that. A lot harder to do that in, the, in a, a static history page. So now you give kids a chance to dig into the data a little deeper, to make different kinds of inferences. You give students a chance to turn that table. One kid likes pie charts, one kid likes histograms. Well, those show you very different things about this data. Let's have the kids talk about it. History teachers already do graph interpretation. That is part of what they do. Now you can do it live. And if the coding is lightweight enough, then maybe, just maybe, the added engagement and the deeper analysis that students are doing, because now, swap out the 1900s data set, load in the 2000s data set. Now they're actually getting more rigorous inferences and testing their hypotheses and writing a more rigorous paper. If you can do that, the teacher might be willing to give you five or six hours to teach whatever minimal coding you need, if you can prove they actually learn the history better. So, yeah, it's not just history. We're finding applications for data science in the sciences. Right? They do this all the time in the sciences. Business teachers have been using spreadsheets to analyze data for decades. A little lightweight coding might, that e might make that even better. In fact, we have an up and running data science curriculum. We've partnered with the KIPP Charter School Network in New York City to develop a grade five data science program. Each week there's a new module involving some mystery thing, right? An archeological dig of Mayan ruins found different skulls and different clay pots. What does the data tell us about the Mayans? Kids look at the data, they make hypotheses, they draw displays of the data, and then you can analyze the data. So this is a real thing that is happening. So that's bootstrap data science. Applications to stats, business, social studies, science classes, and computer science. 
And you better believe we are not thinking of this as a one-size-fits-all. We are in the process of digging through different standards for different subject areas. So if we're doing data science for history teachers, we're going to make damn sure that it looks like a history class. And that is not the same training we're going to do for the biology teachers. It cannot just be, come learn my cool thing. Oh, you're the, you're the expert in history. You figure it out. That's not fair. Yeah? So the standards are not as far apart as one might think. They use different wording. I mean, there, there's a mapping problem. And in fact, tell you what, as I'm looking at the clock, will you ask the exact same question as soon as I switch to Q&A? Because I have a, a detailed answer I think you'll enjoy. Um, so we also have a physics course and a hardcore CS course. The first three are all introductory. They assume no prior knowledge. Reactive says, well, let's transfer what you learned in these different domains and pull it into a CS class and see where you go. We have seventh graders who've done bootstrap algebra who in eighth grade, for those of you who know HTDP, are doing world, big bang world programming with, with like sophisticated data structures because they're just transferring what they learned in the math class. I'm not here to tell you that standalone CS classes are a bad idea. They are, they're a great idea. But I think it's a shame that, stand, that standalone CS classes cannot assume any prior knowledge and must all begin with, what is a program? That sucks. Wouldn't it be cool if you had an integrated pathway where every kid in the school sees computing in context in their math classes, their history classes, their physics classes, their science classes, their business classes. They all do it together so we're getting equity. We're using the teachers that are already in the building and already have their salaries covered. We're getting scale. And we can do it in a rigorous way that makes sure that we're respecting the standards that those teachers need to apply for. Then, the kids who want to self-select into a standalone CS class, imagine where that class could take them if on the way in, they already knew how to write unit tests, how to comment their code, how to write a type specification, how to do some simple analysis, right? Like, those classes could be so much more than they are. So we're not out to get them. We're out to give them a leg up. Um, so, you know, I'm here to tell you, CS education needs to be considered as an engineering problem. There are so many constraints if you want to play in the K-12 space, find out what they are. Sit in on a school day. Shadow a teacher for a day and then shadow a principal the next day. Because there's classroom challenges and there's administrative headaches. And if you haven't thought through all of them, they are going to bite you. Just like not looking at a good spec before you start making a piece of software. At Bootstrap, we've built one of the largest and most diverse CS education programs in the United States at a fraction of the cost and with a team of eight people, only three of us are even full time. So when you want to talk about scale and impact per dollar, we do pretty darn well. And it's because we're slowing it down. We're thinking really hard about what the constraints are. So when we roll something out, we've respected the engineering constraints and the friction pathway is far less. As computer scientists, we need to be humble. We are not bringing the tablets down from the mount and giving them to schools and saying, you're welcome, and then walking away. We need to find out what their needs are. Think about what of our stuff can help them. And surprise, it may not be your favorite part of computer science. PL folks in the room, math teachers don't care. <laughs> um, find out what their needs are and then serve those needs and do it in a way that looks, acts, smells, and tastes like what they already do. And then go get your data. Don't start without a metric. Your job is to teach biology better or history better. And if you can't do that, then you're just asking teachers to, to give up time to teach something that you think is cool. It's hard work, but it is totally doable. And I'm standing here as one of only three full-time employees for a 25,000 student nationwide program that reaches kids in both some of the most elite schools in the US and some of the most struggling schools in the US. And none of this would have been possible without having a sense for what the structure is that we're trying to teach. Big shout out to HTDP for helping us define that structure. This would not have worked if it wasn't for them. And then thinking about how to adapt that structure to different contexts. We can do this. Let's do this. Talk over. All right, any questions? So in the US, it's safe just so easy. How do you deal with that? Yeah. Oh, it's effort. <laughs> effort. So we don't write our curricula in Microsoft Word or Google Docs. 
You'll be horrified to know we write them in Scribble, which is one of the racket languages. Um, but the important thing is, when you're writing a lesson plan that's supposed to be rolled out nationally, everyone needs to see a couple of things, because schools have different interfaces for what lesson plans look like. So one part of the spec is, I need it to be aligned to my standards. Another part of the spec is, oh, tons of schools in the US need teachers to write the learning objective on the board at the beginning of each class. But in some states, it's not called a learning objective. It's called a swabat. You know what a swabat is, right? Students will be able to. Um, so they have their own terminology. And you know, some schools require a do now, or an exit slip, or they, they call it something else. I mean, so what you have is a core piece of content that you've carefully defined the interface for. It's a data structure. And you have all of these other interfaces you want to plug into. If you've done your engineering, you just have to write adapters. You write maps. Right? Oh, I'm an algebra teacher in Kansas. Click, generate, go. And it's, it's a lot of work. But it's just effort. You know? There's no like, oh, how do we crack this? Someone just has to go through the standards and do it. And it can't be the teacher. They're busy. So we do it. Yeah. Just for a second. Normally we, we pause it so that some people may have some reason why they have to Oh, I'm sorry. Scroll, and then we take questions from everybody else who's still saying. So got just it. injecting that and then keeping Of course, if you got to go, thank you for giving up your time. <laughs> yes. So uh, if you could go back to the slide where you showed the data. Mm -hmm. um, yes. We're getting there. Oh, there we go. Yeah. yeah. So um, this is great. Like We love to see progress in mathematics. Um, however, we pulled up the paper, and yeah. for the 2018 version, there were no controls, mm -hmm. which understandably is difficult to do, especially with yep. students. Yep. Um, however, uh, that was going to be our question, which we weren't going to ask. Yeah. Um, you said that there was a 2015 paper. I, I think, uh, hold on, we pulled it up. We pulled it up anyway. 2013, yeah. <laughs> um, and in that study, what had happened is that you guys had had separate schools yep. where you had implemented bootstrap algebra, and yep. then schools where it hadn't been implemented, and measured the result for students and like growth on these specific tests. Yes. So we were wondering, even based off of those controls, considering that they're different programs, they're being taught by different teachers, yep. um, the, the questions that were being assessed in the previous paper mm -hmm. were generally more geared towards material that would have been covered through the Bootstrap Algebra program. How would you, so yeah. our question would be, how would you be yeah. able to confidently tell us that the progress yeah. in mathematics and in function composition and in world work yeah. problems yeah. would be derived from teaching math through bootstrap algebra yes. versus through um, math. And then part two of that aspect okay. is it seems more as if like you are using this to teach math rather than being like learning computer science helps you with math. It's learning math helps, helps you learn you with math. math. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So my, my answer to the second part is yep. Okay. <laughs> right? I mean tower tower problems and whole problems, man. Like I've been at this for over a decade, uh -huh. and I wouldn't bet my career on a clearly visibly computer science programming teaching kids anything other than clearly visibly computer science. I'm sure that some kids will take different things away, but I can't predict what it's going to be or that it's going to work. And man, Papert had way more money and much smarter people on this, and he didn't have any success. Um, but to your first point, Couple of things. So first, I, I'm thrilled that you thought that the assessment felt like a bootstrap assessment, not a math assessment, because every single question on it was completely stolen from the Massachusetts standardized algebra test. So if that seemed bootstrappy to you, we did our job. Those were just dyed in the wool math questions. As far as how do you compare school A to school B, are there any ed researchers in the room? Yeah, it's messy. Yeah. I mean, this is a limitation of essentially all educational research, that there are so many different variables and constraints. It is unbelievably hard to do this comparison. We are, we're gathering data continuously. We're, look, you know, we're trying to grow our N, right? It's a hard problem. What I, I mean, I'm not going to stand up here and say, we proved it definitively. What I will say is, within the limits of what educational research can do, right, we are at that that end point. More data will help, but so, yeah. Based off of your six schools and one control, do you personally feel that there is significant evidence to support that bootstrap algebra is causing students to improve in mathematics? Absolutely. Because there's actually national data for non-bootstrap kids. That's, that's readily available. 
the pre-post over algebra one, just offhand, I'm not gonna ask you the magnitude. Do you think the effect is positive? It's not. Um, I would say that the fact that we're seeing positive results relative to a control group is a pretty significant shift. And we've seen that shift mirror, right, in, the, in later data. If we're seeing it that consistently, and by the way, in the control group in those schools, those schools were, there was some variability. Some of those schools were high performing and low performing. Typically when you're working with gifted kids or remedial kids, you know, if you see the same effect replicated in both, it's a really good sign that what you've created is somewhat fault tolerant. So can I stand up here and say with, with absolute confidence? No, I can't. And I think any ed researcher would, would tell you the same thing. They'll say, to the, the, the data so far suggests X in comparison to what we know about big, big, big data. This is encouraging. But there is no definitive answer. It's really hard to do. Um, it's hard, yeah. Yes, sir. Saying about transfer. Yeah. So, you know, if you really think the problem is as fundamental as you do, I guess there's two things I, I wonder why you don't seem to be worried about, or maybe you are and I missed it. Um, the first is, why are you not worried that in the end you're teaching math and history rather than teaching computer science? Why, why are you not worried that in some sense, you know, injecting computer science into these other parts of the curriculum yeah. might be a good way of teaching math, but might not serve our goal of mm -hmm preparing kids for computer science at all. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, what I've heard in, pa in the past as an argument in favor of Scratch is that it's, it's a good starting point for programming languages that will help students transfer to another language. Mm -hmm. If you believe as little as you do about transfer, why don't we want to focus kids on a language that they might use for something else? Great questions both. So let me answer the second one and go back to the first. Um, uh, there's a researcher named Andreas Stats who's really interesting. Um, he does a ton of statistical analysis of programming at the undergraduate level. And what he's found is that the evidence of transfer between languages is minimal. Right? Like, does, like, learning Java for the first time versus learning Java after learning Python. How much better is it for people at learning Java if they've already been through Python? It's not better, turns out. Um, so I think, I think transfer between languages is sort of a specious thing. Like, there's no data that suggests that it happens well or happens at all. So I don't have any argument that Scratch, like, is will help kids on Python better. I think getting back to the novice versus expert learner thing, if novices get hung up on tower problems versus whole problems, you better believe they're gonna be hung up on the fact that these are pretty colored blocks and that's text. And there's a huge difference between them. Not to mention the fact that Scratch bends over backwards to prevent kids from making mistakes, but making mistakes and dealing with parse and syntax errors is a huge part of the mundane act of programming. And those kids now have an expectation of success that falls apart. So I'm not sitting here saying don't teach Scratch. I think Scratch is a phenomenal tool for doing what it's designed to do. But I don't see the data to support the argument that if, we, if they learn Scratch first, they'll be better at JavaScript than if they learn, say, Pirate first. Um, as to your first question, can you restate that for me? I want to make sure I'm answering that. Well, uh, so, oh, so, so when you said about the second question, I guess that on what basis should we choose a language then? If you don't think there's transfer, yeah. and, oh. Unless, Unless you want to argue students are going to use Scratch later yeah. in their lives, what's the point of their Scratch? Yeah, so I never said that transfer is impossible. I said it's just incredibly hard and requires a lot of forethought and planning to hold off. So if you want to make the claim that teaching programming helps kids learn math, well, a lot of people have tried. And this is sort of also a riff on an answer to what you're asking earlier, right? Lots of people try teaching logo as a vehicle for teaching algebra. Like, the reason Roy P is tenure at Stanford is that he finally put the nail on the coffin and was like, this is not working. Um, if, you want to, if you want to do it right, it turns out getting the language right is only one part of the equation. You also have to make sure that the activities kids are doing look like math, that the pedagogy, the explicit problem solving you're teaching looks like math, and then you've got a chance. I guess the first question was, you know, at that point, maybe do you have to worry that you're teaching math, but you're not teaching anything about computer science anymore? I'm not worried about that. I mean, honestly, like, look, I, I mean, I'm curious for the CS faculty here, how much computer science are kids learning from scratch, in your opinions? Fundamental understanding is still learned. You understand flow control. That's super important for incoming computer science in any field. 
Okay, do you feel that a student who comes in having taken a Scratch class is going to be much better at the Python class than a student who never had any? I feel like not necessarily much better, but they would have fundamental advantage over students who have never touched any form of computer science integration in their life mm -hmm. in understanding basic premises of computer science, logic and flow. So that may be true. There may be data out there that support this. There really might. I'm not saying that there isn't. I think what I'm saying is transfer is such a hard problem I would rather optimize for that, because that, that's what gets computing into math classes. And look, what programming are they learning in Bootstrap? Data types, flow control, functions, variables, function composition, unit testing, proper commenting of code. You know, I'll take it. They're not, they're not learning binary, they're not learning data structures, they're not learning algorithms, they're just not. But you know, maybe we can get some of that in our data science class where they do iteration. So, and again, this, this you're 100% right that, like, as computer scientists, this is a little bit of abandoning some of our goals because we're being humble and saying, well, what computer science is necessary to teach subjects X, Y, and Z? And if it doesn't fit, we're going to drop it. Maybe that belongs in the standalone so I'm, I'm sympathetic to your point, very much so. Um, I see your hand, but since this gentleman hasn't asked a question, I'm going to go with him first. And then, uh, yeah, taking into account the practical considerations is definitely super important. Is there a shining light on the hill of, you know, eventually if you were to say, I could stick this in schools and they would adopt it as we've adopted yeah. math classes over you know, 100 years or whatever, yeah. um, is there a shining light for how you would like to see it integrated into the programs? Uh, for, for computer science being integrated into subjects? Absolutely. Um, as well as learning computer science full stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, one of the nice things about having a shared pedagogy and a shared semantic is that Students who've encountered one of our classes in one context have it's an easier lift to encounter another class in another context. So we would love to see a school, in fact, there's a school in Idaho that actually started doing this a couple years ago. All of their kids, when they go through math, they use bootstrap algebra as part of the regular math class. When those kids go through physics, they're doing bootstrap physics. When those kids go through, I think it's the business class that uses data science, um, and then they use bootstrap reactive in their depth. You know, standalone dynamical CS class. And then they go way beyond. They do stuff that is like beyond what we do. Um, what I want to see is that, that every kid at that school encounters computing, rigorous intro computing, in multiple contexts, right? They're not thinking, oh, computing is what the computer kids do. Computing is what everyone does in every discipline. And frankly, biology teachers know that if their kids become biologists, they're going to be writing code anyway. So I would like to see these disciplines able to better communicate to students what it actually looks like when they go to university or go to the job course, where every kid is competing in multiple contexts, no matter what they do, and they see all their peers doing it, no matter what they look like or what bathroom they do. And then, for the schools that can afford and are ready to offer a CS class, that, that CS class is like absolutely rigorous, real computer science, because it no longer has to assume kids are starting from scratch, pun intended. <laughs> Uh, we'll see Gregor, and then I, I have to take this gentleman's question, of course. Um, so, Gregor, okay. Can, I just want to come back to scale for a second. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how the whole operation works to provide these teachers the training to do this thing? Sure. So, it used to be that we begged school districts to give us a chance. Now that we have some, some evidence that kids are learning math, and by the way, the most important evidence you can get is teachers talk. Teachers love to talk to each other. There's like a whole Twitter sphere in the math universe. <laughs> look, look up hashtag MTBOX, the math, math teacher blogosphere. Um, and so districts come to us and say, look, we're, we want our students to do better at math. Some of our teachers have been talking about you. Will you come out? So we come out. We do an in-person training. Um, typically, there's an online component before the training where student teachers engage with each other. We give them some, some sample problems that are just math, no programming, and they talk about them. We do the independent person PD, and then we fly back to our respective states. How long does it last? Uh, for most of our curriculum, it's three full days. The teachers then implement the program, and they have access to a lot of support. There's online an online community. We do video conferencing office hours at reliable times during the week. They can email us. They can call us. And then, depending on the district, we then may fly back two or three times during the year to have in-person meetings to say, what's going on? What's working? What's not? How can we help? Um, we're looking to move to more of a blended setup for that um, and for other things as well. But that's that's what. What's that all funded? Uh, the district's pay. Yeah. 
And that's the thing, we're not looking for like tech company. I mean, if you're a tech company watching at home, we are looking for money. <laughs> but, but I think that this is important, right? And this sort of speaks to if you're selling schools something that they don't see the value in immediately, right? I'm teaching, you know, I'm at a school that has a lot of struggling students, they need help in math. If I've got pennies and spending them on that, it's irresponsible for me to spend them otherwise. So the fact that so many CSN programs need external funding, not just to start, but to keep going, suggests that there's, the values are missing. Um, all right, Ken, and then back to you as well. Um, that was my question. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I have one nuts and bolts question. When I was looking over the, um, the kind of comparing what you did in data science versus math, yeah. one of the things that stood out is unit testing, which is something we just don't do otherwise in our K to 12 curriculum, which is actually a really useful skill. I mean, I know yeah. work with students, and they, they do like you know, a, a 10 or 20 line algebra derivation to get something absurd at the end. They go, Where's my mistake? And I go, Drop in some numbers, check it at, you know, check at the midpoint, right? There's yeah. computer science to go to unit test. Right. Except for when we think we're not doing computer science and we think we're doing something else and then we throw everything we know out the door. Right. So the question is, do you still like that? So do you see clusters of uh, yeah. kind of methods of thinking because you can do experiments? You know? Yeah. So are there any math teachers in the room or math ed researchers? Because a math teacher would say, what do you mean we don't do unit tests? Do you have any idea how many times a kid wrote down a formula as an answer to a word problem? submitted it to me, and I said, did you seriously not plug in the number of the initial conditions in the problem to see if it worked? Yeah. <laughs> right. Math teachers have been pushing unit testing for like centuries. Um, so they're pretty happy about this. There are some science teachers that were discovered. So this is new, new territory for us. Um, in the physics community, there's a subgroup called the modelers. And the modelers are sort of like the HTTP of the physics group. They're, they have a reputation for being very zealous about what they do. Um, but they're on to something, much like um, <laughs> So their pedagogy is have the students observe a physical system. Bowling ball rolling down a ramp. Station the students every half meter with stopwatches. Record when the ball goes by. That's data that goes in a spreadsheet. Now they make inferences and predictions for what mathematical model must explain this data. That model becomes a predictor. Now they make assumptions, predictions, and they try it out. Right? That's unit testing. That's more unit testing. Right? So we are finding that there is an analog for unit testing in lots of different subject areas. And if you frame it correctly, teachers will see the value in what they're teaching because they see it as their own. They see it as, I'm just, I'm just teaching physics now, um, which is what we want. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah. So initially I, I was going to ask about the idea of actually teaching computer science and then yeah. um, talking about this idea of transfer where you guys are looking at very short term effects of teaching math but yeah. like sneaking in computer science just so that it's not the first time students are seeing computer science. Mm -hmm. um, but then further assessing that like learning computer science as a, a system itself yeah. is like inherently going to create mental development that isn't offered in other certain disciplines, right? Yeah. And so I'm just here to double check that I understand what you're yeah. doing. Your goal as a group is to sneak computer science to students through using other disciplines rather than to, to be able to produce immediate results that teachers can then look at and be like, yes, you taught my students math, mm -hmm. rather than being like, I taught your students computer science, and this is going to help them later on in life with like mental development tasks and problem solving tasks, which I agree maybe don't have immediate short term effects where a student can't apply HTDF or HTTP yeah. immediately to other problems, but will inherently cause some sort of mental development. I mean, two things. One is, I'm not sure I would characterize it as sneaky. Like, maybe from the math teacher's perspective, it's sneaking. Like, right? yeah. we're deliberately dressing it up to be as mathy as possible. Mm -hmm. But I think it would be the characterization to say, Bootstrap teaches math, physics, history, business, and just sprinkles some computing. Mm -hmm. Right? For us, it's the rigor that's good. Okay. The rigor is how you get transfer. Mm -hmm. Because there's an actual methodology and an actual structure, and there is some real CS content there. Mm -hmm. so, I think what we're, what we're trying to do is say, if you have a Venn diagram of real CS and real physics, 
the, there is some intersection. If you just teach the intersection, which one are you faking? Neither. Right? They look, it looks authentic to both groups. And that's sort of what we've done. Right? We find out what that intersection is, and then we do the work, the grunt engineering infrastructure work to make it as easy as possible for teachers and whatever this discipline was to see. Um, the second response I have is, and I'm, not, I'm actually not challenging you. I, I think you're right. I do think learning computer science teaches you ways of thinking that are valuable later. Can you prove it? Has anyone? And so that's what I'm saying. There, there have for sure been cases of understanding just like this is a computer science problem. Mm -hmm. Using this approach to solve other problems does function. And that inherently mm -hmm. will just cause like a certain way of thinking that you, you have to accept, even though I personally don't have any studies on you right now that I can show you. Wait, so why do I have to accept it? The first word you used was surely. Okay, if surely fair. there is, I'm not sure fair I have enough, to Valid, I totally don't have any studies on hand right now that I can throw out to be like, computer science teaches you this. Yeah. But in, in being able to teach a problem solving methodology, right, you are inherently teaching a way to solve problems, yes? By teaching computer science? I'm not saying computer science. You're teaching how to solve problems. We, we are teaching problem yes. solving methodologies, yes. Yes. And so I, I, all I'm saying is that this way of thinking yes. seems to be focusing immediately on short-term results through teaching computer science. Yes? No. No? Why, why do you say focused on short-term results? Well, because you guys are teaching for mm -hmm. a school term, mm -hmm. maybe, yeah. um, and then assessing some quantifiable math skill at the beginning and at the end, yeah. right? You are saying that transfer of knowledge in this case only applies to if I teach a student to solve a problem one way, mm -hmm. can they use that to solve a different problem, right? But that only applies to a very specific subset of testable like, ah, school problems, right? I see. So I would say this. The fact that we are looking, the first place we looked was for transfer into the math class mm -hmm. is because that's the data we needed to justify our existence. Okay. Right? Not having that data is an existential moral crisis. Uh -huh. right? we are, if we can't tell math you teachers... You can't support your program to math teachers. Right. If, if, if otherwise, we're just lying to them. Mm -hmm. right? We're just better at selling snake oil than the next person. Yeah. Um, the fact that that is the data we looked at first, and that's the transfer we cared about the most, does not mean that we don't care about other transfer. And it certainly doesn't mean that other transfer isn't happening. So if you look at the way Gregor teaches, when you look at the way HTDP works, there's no question that a kid who goes through any of our introductory classes will feel shockingly at home mm -hmm. in one of those classes. Mm -hmm. And it's not just HTTP, right? A student who comes in knowing unit testing and having, a, and just, like you said, a sense that there is a method for solving problems. Mm -hmm. A lot of kids don't have that. A shocking number of students think that problem solving is like, you know, the sage on the mountain. They just meditate and the answer came to them. This is like a documented problem in mathematics right now that there's this misconception that it comes to you if you're a mathematician, and if it didn't, I guess you're not. That, there is far transfer, right? I, I think you said it more eloquently than I could. If kids are learning this problem-solving methodology with an appreciation for rigor, an appreciation for if this representation didn't give me the answer, I should probably look for another representation. I should probably write unit tests. That, I think, has far-reaching implications for computer science and for other subjects. Mm -hmm. OK, so then, yeah, all I'm saying then is that you guys aren't saying that learning computer science helps me learn math. You are saying that learning math helps me learn math, but now I also know parts of computer science. We're, we're saying that there are elements of computer science. Right. We're saying that there are elements of computer science that absolutely help you learn math. Okay. It feels like you want the transfer argument to only flow one way. It seems like you're, you're okay with the idea that teaching somebody something that looks only like math is going to transfer to computer science knowledge, but you feel like mm -hmm. The opposite thing won't transfer to math. And, and I understand that it's necessary to do it a certain way, to appease yeah. math teachers and to get it into systems and yeah. to create at least some form of computer science integration. Yeah. It's just um, like your entire premise was that learning computer science teaches you math or is like better you a certain way. Right? Yeah. Whereas I'm disagreeing with you in that I'm saying you are teaching students math and you are on the side or at least through computer science teaching them math. So at mm -hmm. least at the end they have computer science knowledge. Yes. But I disagree with your initial premise that teaching students computer science is causing your math results. So I hear a couple of different things. Yes. One thing I hear is, wait a second, your transfer argument's only working one way. I'm saying this. 
If you want to get computer science into a mainstream subject, there is an immediate existential requirement that you need Obviously. to have predictable yes. transfer. Mm -hmm. Could there be other forms of transfer? There certainly could be. But transfer is notoriously unpredictable. And I'm not going to stand here and make claims about what, what computing kids will learn as a result years down the road or what any other. So I'm not, I'm not making a one-way claim. I'm just saying if you want it to be predictable and reliable in some way, you have to work a lot harder than people think. And so we had to narrowly define those goals. And as far as, restate the last thing you said, I want to make sure I get it right. So yeah. this entire system assumed, like you're, you came up here, right, yeah. and told us that teaching computer science helps students learn math. But I disagree with that claim based off of your results because what you're telling me is that you can yeah. teach math using computer science. Yeah. And so you've taught math and now kids know math but they also have computer science knowledge, which is better than them not having any computer science knowledge to begin with. Yeah. But I'm disagreeing that because they learned computer science, they are now better at math. So here's the thing, this goes back to the Venn diagram. Okay. Right. Did we teach computer science or did we teach them math? You did teach computer science, but... Oh, Gregor, you want to Yes, sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally, no, I can come later. <laughs> I think in, in the thing that you're saying, and you're saying when you say it back, is that you have I think we're really careful about this word computer science. Uh -huh. okay. I, I, my understanding of bootstrap is I always hated computational thinking as a term, and I don't like it any better now. But it's, it's, it's not quite computer science. And in particular, the HTTP stuff is about a, a, a rigorous method of problem solving that, that came out of computer science. But it turns out lots of other people do it too. And so, you know, I think you've got to be a little bit careful about the, whether they're teaching computer science or whether they're taking a thing that was originally super well worked out in computer science, but that other people did it too. Any kind of craft, mm -hmm. any kind of shop class, yes. any kind of reasonable high school has all that stuff. And carrying it over, but also saying, yeah, you know, really deeply understanding computer science makes us pick the right tool. So, so I think it's it's expertise from computer science rather than teaching computer science about computer science. I think that's where that's where the, the disconnection is. And I'd like to talk other folks. Yeah. Okay. Listen, okay. one, two, and three. Sorry, I jumped in. No, yeah, no, that's totally Sorry. fine. So I'd like to jump in with a conjecture on that too, which is that well, my guess is that if you had if students had bootstrap now, bootstrap data science, maybe bootstrap physics, and then Perhaps theoretically, if we then try to make the next step in the curriculum that you have a computer science elective, I bet you can teach a vastly better computer science course than the typical high school computer science elective. Because you know, the, well, the students the bar is not very high. Computer science, <laughs> science, <laughs> science, <laughs> science you know, the bar is not very high. No, the bar is not very high for computer science elective. Sorry, keep going. Okay. 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 That, absolutely, the bar is not very high. Yeah. But just the fact that you can come in and you're not just spending a bunch of time teaching mechanics, right? yeah. and a lot of the concepts would just make sense. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, um, so you say when you develop these curriculums, you also look at sort of uh, like uh, C, you look at what CS concept or introduce, right? Mm -hmm. So have you tried to like look at how you know comparing the people learn these CS concepts through bootstrap um, algebra versus they just learn it in a straight up sort of Mm. Other ways because, right. well, the, and totally we think that if you learn something in applications, you sort of get it better, but we, like, yeah. have you got any evidence we, or? We, have, we haven't assessed it yet. Yeah. It's, it is, it is, it's on our list, but educational research is really freaking hard. <laughs> Gather, gathering data from 13 year olds is <laughs> <laughs> hard. I'm um, just use Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I mean, so, so I mean, we're, we're working on it. Um, but you know, I think our position is that when we look at a lot of the computing classes that are currently being rolled out in K-12, a lot of them, for, for good reason, are also fairly thin on the CS end, just because of all the constraints that we talked about. And so our main concern is, like, are we teaching more CS than them? We think so. But the pants on fire problem that we need to solve is, like, are we making a meaningful contribution to the teachers that are already in the building? So that's where we're focused. And that, you know, that leaves us open to, well, how do you know if you're teaching CS? Well, I think that same question could be asked of a lot of CSM programs. 
How do they know that they're teaching CS? Right, because you can imagine like, in, a, in a school where you have a computer science course, but maybe they can do sort of the physics thing. And that happens too. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a question that we know needs to be answered, um, but we think there's a more pressing concern with respect to the constraints that are in the Yes, sir. So uh, my question was more, is this something that is bootstrap sort of a transitionary solution, right? Mm -hmm. That you want to integrate yeah. computing in a more yeah. uh, systematic way where you actually decide I'm going to not teach something else that I'm teaching right now and yeah. provide more computational skills or whatever yeah. it is. Uh, for example, you know, a lot of stuff that is taught in a math class might yeah. simply be shortcuts because you didn't want to compute it right. because it was right. hard to compute. So if I could define an integral as a limit of a summation, but now I just do this by computer and not worry about doing it in abstraction, maybe this is much easier for people to understand. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so in that, if I think of it in those in that sense, what is yeah. the pathway to sort of getting computing more yeah. firmly embedded? So, I honestly, if someone, if you were to ask me, hey, Emmanuel, do you think computer science will become a core subject akin to math and history. I would say, gosh, I don't know. I actually wouldn't bet on it. But maybe it will. And I think that the integrated approach has a role to play whether or not it does. If computer science never takes off at scale, right? I know that there are small rural schools all over Canada that may never get a qualified CS teacher. Or if they do, man, it's going to be hard to take a lot of time. But they can still teach computing in these subjects. And so maybe it's not a bridge. Maybe for them, that's the path. We get computing all over the place. And you're absolutely right. Not only are we getting computing all over the place, but these subjects, when you look at the university and, and industry level, they use computing all the time. Right? Maybe we are contributing meaningful to mathematics and biology and history and business by actually giving kids a taste of what it looks like when you grow up. Um, but maybe computer science will take off, and there'll be a CS teacher in every school. Then, to your point, we want to set those teachers up for success so that on day one, kids already know a lot. And not only do they know a lot, but they have a mindset that this is for all of us. Even those of us that don't want to be in computer science, even those of us who look different, right? We did this with everyone. We did this with all of our friends and all these other classes. And so, you know what? Why wouldn't I sign up for a standalone CS? It can be a bridge or it can be a road, I think, for different schools. I think schools in Vancouver are much more likely to have CS teachers. It can do double duty. We've got time for one more short question and short answer. Who is next? So, anyone who hasn't asked a question? Uh, yeah, yeah. I have one question, but it's kind of taking the shift in the topic towards the future. Yeah. So while we're talking about all these like, short term effects and at some point, you kind of touch like, and a student that does this kind of bootstrap, and let's say you take like Gregor's one ten, they will like feel at home. Um, so of course, this is super anecdotal, but like I come from a super Turkish background, no com sci. Um, in my eleventh grade, I took the intro to Java through like the Harvard Summer School, which is not really the coolest, but like whatever. Yeah. And then when I took one ten, I was like, oh okay, uh, I actually have to unlearn lots of things because this one summer course. I just got to learn lots of hacky ways to like get stuff to work and I in one time I was like, no, no, this has to be this way. Yeah. And I was wondering, like while you're doing this um, teaching math through math or like teaching anything through that with sprinkles of computer science, that <laughs> um, I'm not gonna first get in every hand have a discussion. Um, did we ever are you ever planning to track these students who might be now like the alumni might be entering university level, yeah. how they're doing in comp sci courses or whether they any chance? So I don't know what the, the ethics around research are, what the ethics boards say in Canada. I know in the United States the answer is no. Mm -hmm. right? We don't know who these students are. We're not allowed to. Um, longitudinal studies in ed research are very hard and require both extraordinary sums of money and extraordinary permission slips from parents. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really hard to do. So we're not in a position to do that right now. We would love to. Right. I want that more than anything. Yeah, yeah. But Northeastern could entry could Northeastern could ent entry poll the students, right? Yeah, yeah. Could, it, could, it, could, it would be volunteer data, so mumble, but 
Yep. Yeah, there, there are many ways to do that at the university level. This would require a lot of coordination with universities, and given how many different universities Boston kids alone go to, right? We might have a small sample size for those who live in Northeastern. But it's certainly worth checking out. I mean, I think where I want to leave this perhaps, because I know we have to wrap up, is you know, you were mentioning that you took this online Java class and you felt like you've learned all these hacky ways to like write Java syntax that didn't necessarily apply to like programming challenges. And I think if you ask, if you're at a party and you, and you meet someone who says, oh, I'm a chemistry teacher, and you ask them, oh, cool, what do you teach? You might expect them to say something like, oh, I teach orgo, I teach physical chemistry, right? You would never expect them to say, I teach Bunsenberg. <laughs> and if you meet a math teacher, what do you teach? Oh, I teach calculus, I teach, you know, geometry. You would never expect them to say, I teach calculus. Computer science might be the only discipline where at K-12, teachers identify as the tool. I teach Python. I teach Java. And even at the undergrad level, I think there's a lot of this that goes around, where a course on Java, I mean, literally, say again? Amen. Yeah. <laughs> literally, literally a, they call the course Java, right? Like, and so if, you teach, if, you, if we view ourselves as teaching kids a tool, then that's what they're going to learn. And that doesn't mean that you're learning programming or computer science. And I think we, have, we as computer scientists have a lot to give to the world. We also have a lot to learn. And one thing you have to learn is that you need a pedagogy. It doesn't have to be HTTP, but it has to be something, right? What are we teaching if not the tool? There's something else, something magical. And if we can be explicit about it, instead of just being like, do this problem, do this problem, and did you figure out the connection? Like, let's just tell them. And if you do that, you dramatically increase the likelihood of transfer. Because then they can try to, they have a structure that they can try to glom onto things. And sometimes it'll fit jackpot, and sometimes it won't, and they have to stretch the structure and generalize their knowledge. But if we give them no structure whatsoever, my first Java class didn't want to drop out of college. I almost did. Um, so we need a pedagogy. And uh, that's why I'm on board with the whole HTTP. So you guys have been great. I so appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.